The great art of yoga is not just meant for physical benefits. The great art of yoga is not just meant to calm the mind, but the great art of yoga and the science of this spiritual technique of yoga is ultimately meant at creating a connection between the soul and the Supreme Soul. And that, yo that yoga, union, connection of a relationship with the Divine empowers all of your relationships in this world. Sometimes we don't make the link between a cause and effect. Have you noticed that happens often? Sometimes the cause and the effect is very, very clear. Uh, you overeat and then the next morning you have a stomach ache. It's very clear. Cause and effect. Can anyone give me an example of a cause and effect in their life that you later on made a connection of that wasn't immediately apparent to you, uh, maybe in the moment or in that time, but later on when you reflected, you realized, oh, if I do that, then that tends to happen. Have you ever noticed anything like that? Anyway, like for example, Srila Prabhupada, our spiritual teacher, he made a connection that I had never made before. When I read some of his writings, he said, the reason that there is war in the world is because people um, indiscriminately kill animals. And, in, and when I first read that, I thought, what's the connection between killing animals and world war? But when you actually analyze it a lot closer, you can actually see that the kind of mentality, the kind of qualities, the, the um, desires and the yeah, sensitivity or insensitivity that animal killing breeds uh, leads to world conflict. So that was a connection that was made by a great spiritual teacher. One of the connections, other connections I made in my life is that often we feel like we want to calm our minds, we want to be able to meditate, we want to just experience some peace from the roller coaster of life. Put your hands up if you would like to have a calmer mind. Uh, yeah, all of us. And um, one of the connections I made was that if our relationships are rocky, if our relationships are difficult, if we're not having proper interactions and loving exchanges with other people, then it's going to be very, very difficult to meditate. Uh, you have to be able to mediate relationships before you can meditate and create a steady mind. And in this day and age, to mediate relationships is so difficult. Have you noticed? Yeah. Boyfriend and girlfriend, or husband and wife, or parent and children, or so many relationships we have, and it's so difficult in this age to actually meet the, the meeting of hearts. They say when two people are angry at each other, you know why they shout? It's a bit strange because they're right next to each other. <laughs> like, why are you shouting? You're right next to that person. Well, one ancient Sufi saint, he said, the reason why people shout when they're angry is because although they're next to each other physically, their hearts have become so far apart. And because their hearts are so far apart, they feel the need to shout to try and make up that distance that has been created. And have you noticed it works the other way as well? When you have a very loving relationship and your heart is very close to someone, sometimes you can be within them in the room and you don't even have to say a word, just the movement of the face and they understand you and you understand them because the hearts are very, very close. We can take a moment in our life to think, how many heart-to-heart -heart relationships do I really have in my life? Yes, thousands of followers on social media, hundreds of numbers on my phone book, 
uh, plenty of emails and messages coming through my devices but how many heart-to-heart -heart relationships do I have? So learning how to mediate relationships and come together and meet in that way is a very, very important part of having steady and peaceful consciousness. We argue. It's interesting, in the Vedic literatures it said that there are four cosmic ages. Um, the first cosmic age in Vedic Sanskrit is known as Satya, or the age of truthfulness. The next age in Sanskrit is known as Dwapara, uh, sorry, Treta, then Dwapara. And the age we're currently living in is the age of Kali. It's almost like you have four seasons in a year and this is the cosmic season of winter. It's darkness, it's cold, people are cold. And the way Kali Yuga or the age of darkness is described is as the age of quarrel and hypocrisy. So this is the age of quarrel. People just fight over everything. They fight over um, you know, this supermarket rage, road rage. Uh, they say if you want to have an argument on Facebook, it's really easy. Just put in a comment and wait. <laughs> and there'll be plenty of uh, counter arguments coming against what you've said. So in this age, we fight about everything. Uh, we have an argument. How many of us have had an argument in the last week? Um, so many arguments. So how do we uh, mediate relationships in this world is such an important aspect of our spirituality. And so the ancient sages and the teachers and the scriptures through various anecdotes, they tell us different principles which can help us to have better uh, relationships. So very, very briefly today I'll share some of those principles with you by which we can have better relationships. And then, uh, and then I'll open it up and see whether you may have any questions or comments or reflections because, yeah, we want to make it alive and applicable to your life. The first very, very important principle in mediating better relationships in this world is that we have to accept people for who they are. One of the biggest blocks in relationships is when we expect and uh, assume and project who we are on every single other person. They should have a personality like me, they should have desires like me, they should respond to things like me, they should have the same likes and dislikes as me, and we unconsciously do this so much. Sometimes they say, treat people as you would like to be treated. But nowadays I think maybe we should use the dictum, treat people as they would like to be treated. Because you know what? We're all different. We all have a different personality. We all have different abilities. We all have a different approach to life. And we're all uniquely individual. And what we too often do is project ourselves on others. Once there was a mother and father and they were having an argument. And the argument got so heated that they had to go to court. So they came in front of the judge and they were still arguing and the, uh, the lady said, he should be an accountant. And the man said, no, no, he should be a doctor. She said, accountant, doctor, accountant, doctor. And the judge was watching the whole argument. And he said, uh, what are you arguing about? And he said, it's about our son. He should be an accountant. No, doctor, accountant, doctor. And then the judge looked at both of them and said, but why don't you just ask him what he wants to be? And they both looked at him, the judge, incredulously, and they said, but he's not born yet. <laughs> Which was interesting because already, even before a child is born, everyone's got it all planned out, what you should be, who you should be, how you should be. 
because in this day and age the tendency to project ourselves on others is so great and therefore we are are very quick to uh, judge others um, because they seemingly don't act like we would expect them to act. And so one of the first things in relationship building is recognizing that every soul is unique, every person is unique. And instead of expecting everyone to be like you, try to understand what are their unique qualities, what are the unique ways in which they function that can maybe you can learn something from. The glory of life is not that we surround with ourselves with people who are carbon copies of us. That would actually be a pretty dull life. Um, we can surround ourselves with people who are different, who have different opinions, who have different approaches to life. And you know what? We can also surround ourselves with people who disagree with us. Really? Disagree? No one should disagree with me. But every disagreement doesn't have to be an argument because sometimes disagreement is good because it gives us different ways of looking at things. So the first principle I want to share with you today of how to have better relationships, how to mediate better relationships is accept. Accept people for who they are instead of trying to change them or um, expect them to be like you. Just like when we go in a plane, especially if you're as tall as me, like six foot five, then when you go to the check-in counter, uh, then the first thing you ask for is the emergency seat. Because on a long flight, you need a bit of leg room, you know, you need a bit of leg room to relax. Otherwise, it's a long flight. So in your relationships also, give people a little bit of leg room. This is the yoga of non-intervention. You don't have to like intervene every time. Just give them a bit of space. Give them a bit of breathing room. And then you'll find that people are much more likely to want to connect and open up to you. But when we're intense and we have intense expectations, then people naturally are moving away from us. The second very, very important principle in uh, relationships mediating relationships is not just that you should be accepting but also you should be trusting. Have you noticed that the age we live in is like a super skeptical age? Every time someone does something we make a judgment. Yeah, maybe it was because of this, maybe it was because of that. Why would they say such a thing? And immediately in our mind a hundred thoughts are coming through of the worst thing that it could be. Isn't it? You wake up in the morning, you're having a great morning and all it takes is for someone to look at you a little bit funny. <laughs> and then the whole day is going through your mind, how can they do that? Da, da, da. People uh, don't have trust in each other anymore. We always jump to a conclusion that it's uh, the worst thing. There's an ancient story of a king who was once giving out free... Uh, food. So he was giving out free food in these bowls, you know, out of his magnanimity. So he, he was handing them out to the, the people. And as he gave out a bowl, what was happening is as he was reaching out to give out a bowl, on the top there was an eagle that was flying and this eagle had just caught a snake, which was its dinner for the day. And as this eagle came over with the snake in its mouth, just as they went over that pot, which this king was going to hand over to someone, because the eagle had the snake in its beak, the snake kind of spit out some poison, and that poison landed in this pot. And then the king gave it, not knowing anything. And so the king gave it to this person. And then this person just like ate it and like dropped dead. So then it said the karma police came. In ancient Vedic theology, there are karma police. Just giving you a tip off there. Um, so then they came and they said, who should get the karma for this? This guy's laying here dead. Someone has to get the karma for this. So they said, should it be the king? Because he's the one that gave the food. 
but he, he was he had a good motivation he was being kind he was being compassionate how can you blame him then they said well maybe it should be the bird but what was the bird doing the bird was just going about its daily affairs having you know having its lunch for the day everyone's got to eat after all even an eagle so you can't give it well then it has to be the snake but how can you give the karma to the snake? It's not its fault that it has poison. That's just the way it was made. That's just nature's arrangement that its body has poison in it. So they're all baffled. They're thinking like, who do you give the karma? Someone's got to take the karma here. Otherwise, we're going to have to take the karma. Who's going to take the karma? And then right there, there was a lady who was watching the whole scene. And, she, and, and, and they overheard her. And she was talking to the other people and she was saying, I knew it. I knew that king. I knew that king was like a fake. I knew he was out to actually harm us. He's not there to protect us. And she was criticizing, criticizing. And the karma police looked at each other and they said, I think I know who we can now give the karma to. <laughs> the critic gets the karma. Because we're so quick in this world to jump to conclusions, to make a, a judgment on someone else. When actually situations, people, uh, instances are very, very complex. So the second major aspect in relationship building is that we have to be trusting. You have to give people the benefit of the doubt. You have to uh, go by the principle of innocent until proven guilty. Don't jump to conclusions. Because if you do, then what will happen is that you'll block the opportunity for something deeper to take place. Because you haven't allowed that relationship, the space and time to evolve. Because you've intercepted it artificially. So the second major principle is trusting which is so difficult in this age because people let us down, people broke our trust, people promised so many things and then they didn't deliver, people who we put our faith in ended up having not such good uh, motivations and therefore we're very, very defensive, we're very, very doubtful. But relationships can't form unless you're ready to give that level of trust. The third thing that goes in a relationship, if you want to mediate them very well, is investing. You have to invest. Sometimes people think a relationship is like love at first sight. Now here I am sitting here as a monk in front of you and I'm not going to pretend to be the love doctor. <laughs> but the reality is that Chemistry may bring people together, but it's commitment, it's character, it's selfless service to each other that keeps them together. So if you want a relationship to work, it's not just about chemistry, it's not just about instant connection, it's not just about the fact that you think that, yeah, I just vibe with this person. Uh, maybe there are instances like that, but ultimately the depth of any relationship is going to be proportionate to how much you invest in that relationship. So how much are you giving? How much are you serving? How much selflessness and sacrifice are you ready to make to make that relationship something substantial? If there's no service, there's no relationship, you see. It's like uh, if we're constantly, a magnet can attract or a magnet can repel. So if in our minds we're always self-absorbed, we're thinking about ourselves, what will I get from it? What does it mean for me? How will this affect my um, day tomorrow? When we're constantly thinking about ourselves, then we um, repel people from us. People are not... Um, attracted. But when we're in a mood of investing, giving, serving, sacrificing, trying to generally contribute to someone else's life, then we act as a magnet which attracts and people naturally gravitate towards us. 
people naturally come and want to uh, engage with us. So therefore, the third principle in building deeper relationships is investing. Invest your time, invest your love, invest your effort. Um, relationships aren't made overnight. Relationships are made over a time when two individuals really give themselves to each other. Then we uh, experience deeper connection. Srila Prabhupada, our teacher, he said the purest type of love in the world is the love between a mother and a child. Because the level of investment of a mother or a father in their children is practically unparalleled. They're there all the time, no matter how obnoxious or ungrateful or um, unresponsive the child is. The mother keeps giving, keeps loving, keeps uh, being there. And so we shouldn't have a, a kind of utopian or romantic idea of relationships. They require investment. They are formed over time. Now the interesting thing is, even when you're accepting, even when you're trusting, and even when you're investing in relationships, still people may not act as you expect them to act. And therefore the fourth principle that the sages give in relationship building is you have to be forgiving. Because you know what? People are going to do things wrong. People are not going to respond as you'd like them to respond. People are going to sometimes say something hurtful. Sometimes people are going to uh, do things that you would never have expected them to do. And how are you going to respond to that? At the first sign of a mistake, at the first sign of a weakness, are we going to cut the relationship? People do that. They have one argument and then they don't speak to the person for years. That's incredible. Because in this age, we're not forgiving. Um, so therefore, we have to learn that art of forgiveness. The goal of life is not to remember all the terrible things that someone did against you. The goal of life is to remember all the wonderful things that you're receiving every moment. But if your mind is not free and open to uh, receive all of those things and acknowledge all of those things because it's hijacked by negativity, then life will not be a very happy life. So one of the great arts of life is learning to let go, learning to forgive. Because people walk around with such a heavy burden on their shoulders. When Nelson Mandela went to prison and he came out after 20 plus years wrongly imprisoned, then he came out and the interviewer asked him, what are your thoughts and feelings now you're coming out of the prison? And he said, as I walked out of the prison, I was thinking to myself that now I've walked free of that cell. But if I don't give up my bitterness, if I don't give up my negativity, if I don't give up my grudges, if I don't give up my bad feelings towards my perpetrators, then even though I've walked free from the cell, I'll still be an imprisoned man imprisoned by our own emotions, imprisoned by our own anger and grudges because we haven't learned the art of how to forgive. How heavy is a cup of water? Five ounces, seven ounces, nine ounces? It's as heavy as how long you hold it for. Everyone has a different cup. And everyone has a different amount of water in it, the negative things people have done to you. But how heavy is someone's cup? Someone has a bit more water, someone has a bit less water, someone's gone through some more heavy relationship things, others a little less. Everyone has something. But what makes it heavy is not the amount of water. What makes it heavy is how long you hold it for. And therefore, one of the great teachings of life is that when we want to mediate relationships, forgiveness 
is perhaps one of the biggest qualities. And the fifth and final principle which I'll give you today to focus on and think about and contemplate in relationship building is that if you want to mediate the best relationships, you don't just have to be accepting, you don't just have to be trusting, you don't just have to be investing and forgiving, but ultimately it's all about connecting. There's a divine source, a divine person, a supreme reality that all of us are part of. The great art of yoga is not just meant for physical benefits. The great art of yoga is not just meant to calm the mind, but the great art of yoga and the science of this spiritual technique of yoga is ultimately meant at creating a connection between the soul and the Supreme Soul. And that, yo that yoga, union, connection of a relationship with the Divine empowers all of your relationships in this world. Because when you connect with the Divine and you're experiencing so much love in that vertical relationship with the Supreme Person, then what happens is because you're so fulfilled in your deeper relationship with the Divine, it means in the horizontal relationships of everyone in this world, you can give yourself freely without expecting so many things from them. One of the biggest relationship breakers is because people come together to fill a vacuum in their heart. A girl and a boy come together and then it breaks after some time. Why? Because they each had a vacuum and they were coming together to take something from the other person to fill a vacuum in their heart. But when they come together as connected spiritual beings who are connecting with the Divine, then they come together with such a fulfillment that they can genuinely serve and contribute to each other's life in a very, very selfless way and, uh, and really develop uh, a higher grade of love, Divine love. So there are different types of love. There's physical love, there's emotional love, but ultimately there's divine love, spiritual love. And that divine love and spiritual love occurs in relationships when first and foremost we as individuals are connecting to a higher source. Um, and through that union, everything in this world um, becomes much easier to navigate. And so please think about these points as you go through your relationships. Learning to uh, mediate relationships is perhaps the number one life skill in the world because everyone has to do it and everyone has to do it on a daily basis and everyone has problems with it but everyone also concedes that it's the greatest source of happiness as well. So try to meditate a little bit on some of these principles and think about your relationships and then ask yourselves where you could be applying some more of these so that you can connect with people on a much deeper level. And when we have those good relationships, then naturally you will see that the mind becomes so much more peaceful, that the mind is able to deal with much more things. You have more resilience, you have more grace, you have more um, strength um, to, to deal with anything else that comes in life. But when relationships are difficult, when relationships are non-existent or weak or rocky, then everything else in life becomes that much harder. Um, so, yes, let us think about this. Uh, relationships are the essence of life and relationships are a deep spiritual science um, that we can learn more about when we study uh, this ancient wisdom. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So thank you for patiently listening. Um, I don't know if anyone would like to ask any questions or 
if you have any reflections or anything you would like to share. Yeah, over here. <laughs> When is when is how do you make the difference between forgiving and walking away, or forgiving and still staying or like still maintaining a relationship with the person that has done maybe wrong? Like, wh wh where what's the what's the limit behind? Like, what's what's the balance between the two, and how how do you know which way <coughs> to go? Yeah. So how do we know in a relationship whether it's time to walk away or whether it's time to or whether it's worthwhile to stay and try and work through it? The first thing as I would say whether you walk away or whether you decide to stay with it forgiveness is essential in both situations. Because if you decide to stay unless there's no any forgiveness there's no room to develop that relationship and try to start afresh. And when you walk away, unless there's forgiveness, uh, you may have walked away, but in your mind and heart, you'll still be in the midst of that relationship because you're holding it within a deeper space. Forgiveness, I'll just say before I address your other point, forgiveness also doesn't mean that we don't take practical action. Forgiveness is very much an internal thing. So if someone's acting towards us in a harmful way, Forgiveness doesn't mean to just keep going back and getting harmed by that person. It may mean that you take practical action and keep some distance. And, but internally, you understand that there's something I need to learn from this. There's something I need to uh, utilize in this situation in order to grow, to evolve, to develop myself. And I appreciate the lesson that I got from this, even though the interaction was difficult. And in that way, you come to a level of forgiveness. Now, in what sense should you walk away from a relationship and when should you stay? It's all dependent on what you feel the capacity is for there to be change in a relationship. At a certain point, some relationships become so toxic that we know this is not going to change. There's no room for improvement here. I tried so many times. But still, how many of us hold on to toxic relationships that are harming us because of some, uh, some other attachment within the heart? So it's really an art to be able to let go. And we let go and we walk away from something when we realize that there's no development, there's no progress, there's no room for growth here. Um, and Sometimes that, that takes bravery to walk away because then we walk into an unknown, we walk away from some kind of known situation into the unknown. But we have to have that bravery because otherwise simply staying in situations which are um, unhelpful and toxic create a lot of harm. Therefore it's very interesting, if you look at the progression of the Bhagavad Gita, which is the main scripture that Vedic teachers talk about. There are three main sections in the Bhagavad Gita and they're known as Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga and Jnana Yoga. If we would translate that into modern terminology, Karma Yoga means the yoga of how to live. Bhakti Yoga means the yoga of how to love. And Jnana Yoga means the yoga of how to let go. And so one third of the whole Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is explaining the science of how to let go. Because there's such a fear within us to let go of certain things. But sometimes uh, we have to let go of something in order to grasp something better. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Those were some thoughts. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have any uh, questions or anything they would like to ask? Any reflections? Yes. Um, thanks so much for the nice talk. Um, I was just wondering, uh, nowadays I think uh, people get into relationships quite much, much later than previously. And I think um, kind of 
building a good relation with oneself becomes much more important. So uh, what suggestion or advice could you give on how to build that relationship with oneself, that healthy relationship? So you're saying, uh, uh, how, how should we build a relationship with ourself in a much better way so that then we can then go and have a better relationship with others, like that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's really important to know ourselves. And sometimes we think, of course I know myself. I've lived with myself my whole life. Uh, of course I know myself. But actually we don't. We don't actually know ourselves. Sometimes we have a vision of ourselves which is quite warped. One person, he said, I'm not who I think I am. I'm not who you think I am. Who, I'm who I think you think I am. In other words, we have a certain conception of who we are. We have a certain conception of how people are seeing us. We have a certain conception of our strengths. But that may not always be accurate. And one of the main reasons why we can't have good relationships is because we have the wrong conception of ourself. And so how do we find out and know more about ourselves and have a better relationship with ourselves? The first important thing is introspection. In a world which is so busy, people just don't think anymore. They don't think, they don't reflect on their lives. How was I interacting with others? Uh, what are my strengths, what are my weaknesses. Uh, people don't uh, explore their own character with reference to wisdom. Uh, but the moment we start doing that, we get a better sense of who we are. And, uh, and, and that helps in relationships, because we know when we're going into a relationship, I have this weakness, so I should be careful about this. So one important tool in knowing yourself better is introspection. Another important tool in knowing yourself better, which all of us hate, is feedback. Mm -hmm. How many people are there in our lives who can genuinely give us feedback? Who can genuinely tell us and give us the bitter pill of where we need to improve and where sometimes we're um, failing, falling short. Uh, if you don't have people who can give you feedback, if you don't have a perspective outside of yourself to give you an objective um, vision of yourself, then maybe you will continue on in an illusion for a long, long time. And therefore they say feedback is the breakfast of champions. So we should have people in our life who can tell us where we need to improve. And not just people who tell us where we need to improve, but people who tell us where we're already doing good. And so we can develop and work on that further. And so when we have that feedback, then it, um, then it helps. So if you want to know yourself better, introspection, feedback. And the final thing I would say is spiritual practice. Because when you meditate, when you connect on a spiritual level, then what happens is you awaken a consciousness which goes beyond your material mind and your material intelligence. And you develop a kind of self-awareness that goes beyond the boundaries of what we've known for our whole life. And therefore, when people spiritually advance, when people spiritually connect and get in tune with themselves on a deeper level, they begin to see things that previously they never saw um, because of elevation of consciousness. And so um, knowing yourself on a deeper level comes through uh, spiritual development and spiritual <coughs> development comes through spiritual practice. And so that's another way. So yeah, like this, when we know ourselves better and we have a healthier relationship of ourselves um, with ourselves, then we can go out in the world and, and connect with people better. I hope that helps. Okay, thank you. Anyone else like to ask anything? Yes? Yeah, I have, I have a small question. So as you mentioned, um, connecting with ourselves and also loving ourselves is a way to be able to love. Sometimes I feel like a lifetime is too short to know ourselves or even to be able to love. 
in trying to achieve this oneness. And most of the time when we move on, we realize that actually what bothers us in other people is actually our own demons and darkness that are actually <coughs> in the other people. Mm. And it takes time actually to love our imperfections. And maybe my question is like, how do we actually try to connect with people? Because this is the goal of life, loving and connecting, even if there is so much imperfection in the world and in ourselves. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, so how do we connect with people even when we know uh, there are imperfections and if we wait for perfection in ourselves or if we wait for perfection in others, will we ever really have a loving relationship? Yeah, love and relationship and connection is not about perfection. It's not about seeing or two individuals being perfect before they can connect. But it's about them being perfectly aware of each other's imperfections and how to deal with that in a progressive, kind and um, encouraging way. The problem why, the reason why imperfection causes relationship block is because we don't know how to deal with that imperfection. That imperfection angers us, that imperfection uh, confuses us, that imperfection blocks us from wanting to give ourselves to that person. But when we can see imperfection and frame it in, the, in an appropriate way and understand how all of us have imperfection and we're working through it, then two people can still come together and help each other to come out of imperfection if they know how to perfectly respond to imperfection. And so therefore, it's not, um, we should not have a utopian vision of others. Uh, we're not perfect and other people are not perfect, but we can perfectly deal with that and, and uplift each other. And, and that's the science of deeper sensitivity, which is so much a part of spiritual development. So yeah, thank you for raising that point. It's, um, it's about finding love in imperfection. Yeah, very nice point, thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's similar to what we're talking about here. People are not perfect. People's conceptions are often not perfect. And, um, but that doesn't mean you can't have a relationship. When we're answering the first question um, about when to walk away from a relationship, we walk away from a relationship when we realize there's no room for growth. There's no room for improvement. There's no room for progression. So I guess I have both experiences in my life, connecting with people who had imperfections, but there was no room for growth, there was no openness to, for dialogue, there was, no, um, yeah, there was no progression there. And oftentimes in those times I wasted a lot of time trying to change things, change relationships, change people uh, who didn't want to be changed. And therefore, sometimes you have to just give people space, breathing space, and then come back later uh, when there is opportunity. So I have that experience, but I do also have the experience of people who had certain opinions or certain conceptions or certain imperfections. Um, but through our relationship, uh, they changed. In fact, I can say I had imperfections and someone invested time in me. Um, and because they invested time in me and educated me in my own imperfection, um, I also Im improved. So yeah, definitely, I think uh, that gives us great hope in relationship building because if we look, go, go out there and we just look for perfection, we're probably not going to be able to connect to anyone. 
You know, one time, they, one person, he came to our spiritual teacher and he said, I just can't tolerate this person anymore. And the teacher said to him, you have to tolerate him just as I'm tolerating you. <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of think like we're just the perfect one and we're tolerating everyone out there. And like, why can't any of these guys get it together? And like, no, he's got all these imperfections, but we're sitting there with our own imperfections. So like here, um, beautifully said, we often project our own imperfections on others. You know, what we see is very likely something within ourself. As the old English dictum goes, it takes one to know one. <laughs> so maybe we've got some, a, bit, a little bit of that within us. So yeah, we have to. People change. That's a, that's a wonderful thing to know. And so give it a try.